So hi everyone, I'll wait a few uh, minutes for everyone or um, as many people as possible to join before we start. Hi guys. Right, cool, so I'll do a little bit of an introduction while I wait for um, more people to join. So hi everyone, today um, what we're gonna be going through is dependent and independent probability. This, um, this session today is for foundation GCSE maths. I mean, if you are doing higher um, maths as well, it will still be relevant to you. Um, this session today will be an hour long and, it, and I'll be the tutor going through it with you. Um, so I'm Evelyn, um, if you guys are new and you don't know me, I am Evelyn and I am studying maths for my master's degree at University of Birmingham. Um, if you have any questions throughout the session, make sure to um, put them in the Q&A section. If you want to participate and show me what answers you've gotten, also put those in the chat for me. Um, yeah, and um, if you miss anything throughout the session as well, um, it, it is recorded and it will be put on the My Tutor YouTube page as well. So um, you can always go back and look over anything that you've missed or anything that you didn't quite understand when we were going through it um, during this hour session. So um, let's go to the session. Cool. So um, hi everyone, anyone who's just joined and um, missed what I've said. Um, today it's going to be an hour session on dependent and independent probability. So before we start, um, let's have a quick recap of what we did um, last week on Wednesday. We were looking at alternate and corresponding angles. So a few things to remember, alternate angles are equal. So those ones are um, your Z, um, the ones that make a Z shape. Oops, so it would be those angles in between there. Corresponding angles are, all, are also equal. Um, those give you your F shape. So it would be these two angles and co-interior angles add up to 180 degrees. So that is your C shape or your U shape, however you decide to remember it. Um, and those are your angles inside of um, the shape. Also remember, some of you might remember these angles being called allied angles as well. That's also correct. You can also write those. You can also write down that explanation in your exam as well. Right, and then after angles, we moved on to congruent triangles. Now, congruent triangles are triangles which are exactly the same. They're identical in size and in shape. Now, there's a few criteria which you have to remember in order to spot um, congruent triangles, and they are as follows. So you have SSS, so side, 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 all three sides are equal or you could have SAS, so you've got two sides and one angle, and the angle must be between the two sides. Then you also have angle side angle, so you've got two angles and a corresponding side. Now, um, what we mean by corresponding side is just the exact same side in both of the triangles have to match up and be the same. And the last one is RHS. So a right angle, the hypotenuse and a corresponding side are equal. Now, and one thing to remember is that AAA is not a criteria for congruent triangles. You cannot have three angles which are the same and use that as an explanation for um, congruent triangles. So um, with that in mind, um, let's go to uh, the first recap question. So um, here we, it is a congruent triangle question. So we've got this triangle, this large triangle ABC, and they told us that it's an equilateral triangle. Now D lies on BC and AD is perpendicular to BC. So they want us to now prove that triangle ADC is congruent to triangle ADB. So um, we haven't gone through a question like this, so it's good that we are going through um, an exam example. This is from a foundation exam past paper. 
Now, first of all, um, we should think, how would they be congruent? What could we um, show that it's exactly the same in both um, triangles? So we want to show that, um, oops, that this triangle over here is equal to this triangle over here. Now, first of all, both triangles share a side. They both share AD. So we can write that down, first of all, if I zoom out as well for a second. So first of all, um, they share a side. So you can um, write down that um, triangle ADC and triangle ADB share the side AD. So that's the first step. We know that one side in both of the triangles is exactly the same. And that's also their um, vertical side. So it's exactly the same side in both triangles. Um, another thing that um, we can tell is that they've told us that it's an equilateral triangle. So we know that this side over here is going to be equal to this side over here as well. So we can write that down. We can say that A B is equal to AC. Now, there's two ways that you can um, write down the explanation for this. Remember, when you do do proof um, for congruent triangles, you always have to put down your explanation. It's not enough to just say AB is equal to AC. Now, um, one thing you could write is given, or the other thing that you could write is um, because... ABC is an equilateral triangle. Yeah, that's enough um, to get you another mark. And then the final thing, we have to think of um, another point, which could make sure that this is a congruent triangle. Now, if we remember our criteria, we have SSS, SAS, ASA and RHS. So it's not going to be ASA because we don't have two angles. We only have one angle. We have a right angle. So that's another point that we could make. And if we do use a right angle, um, we could use the criteria RHS because remember, um, this side over here, AC and AB, they're our hypotenuse. They're the side opposite, they're the longest side in the triangle and the side opposite are 90 degrees. So it is a hypotenuse. Um, we also have one side and we have a right angle in each one because remember angles on a straight line add up to 180 degrees, which means that this angle at D must also be 90 degrees. So you can write that down as well. So you can say angle BDA equals 90 degrees um, and just write down your reason because angles on a straight line add up to 180 degrees. And then the final thing that you should do is write down your final statement as to why it's congruent. So you can write down RHS. So you've got a right angle, which we have in both. We've also got a hypotenuse, which is exactly the same in both. Hypotenuse. And we've also got a side, which is exactly the same in both as well. So um, this is enough to get you all three marks in the exam. You've got um, your right angle, your hypotenuse and your side. So that would be enough to, um, to get you all of the marks. So hopefully that clears up um, congruent triangles a little bit. Um, a lot of you are asking about Kahoot. Um, yes, I did decide that um, from from now on with sessions, we will do one exam um, past paper question and we will do um, a very short Kahoot session as well. So um, let me get this part up as well for you. Um, 
I would like like everyone to sort of participate with this one if you could quickly log in um, to the session and we will do a quick recap on alternate and corresponding angles um, and yeah hopefully we can do a little bit of um, this Kahoot and then we can go on to um, doing the actual session on dependent and independent probability. So I will start this in a second. So if everyone could try and log in if you can, if not, still participate, um, still participate at home. And this shouldn't be too, too long. And this will take us into um, the next session as well. The next um, actual topic we'll be going through today. Perfect. I am going to start now, guys. So um, if you haven't managed to sign in, then you can use the pin at the bottom of the screen to sign in. So starting with the first question. So angle X is 59 degrees. What is the reason for this? So take a look at the diagram. What is the reason um, for X being equal to 59 degrees? Remember guys, it is timed. Cool, perfect. For those of you who did manage to um, answer, um, it is alternate angle. So if I show you again, we have a Z shape here. So remember Z shape, we call it alternate. We don't call it Z shape. If you do call it a Z angle in your exam, you will not get the mark. And remember corresponding is the F, um, the F shape, yeah? So let's have, um, so well done uh, for everyone who got that right. Let's have a look at this question. So co-interior angles add up to 180 degrees. Is that true or is that false? Perfect, it is true. So remember co-interior angles, I did say um, this in the beginning, remember they do add up to 180 degrees and it makes that C or that U shape. So well done everyone who got that one right as well. And then we're on to our final question, which is worth double the points. What is the angle X? So take a look at the diagram. This one you have got a little bit more time for, so don't rush it, take your time and work out what will angle X be equal to. Well done for everyone who got that right. It is 67 degrees. So if we quickly go through it, so to get to angle X, there is more than one way that you could have done it. You could have um, used interior co-interior angles to work out what this angle would be, um, QRD, and then use vertically opposite angles that equal to get X equals to 67. Or you could have um, done an alternate angle to use your Z shape and gotten this angle at R, and then angles on a straight line add up to 180 degrees to get to 67. So there was more than one way of doing it, but the correct answer was 67 degrees. So well done, guys. That was sort of like a quick recap. We will go through another Kahoot at the end on the session that we're about to go through. So well done, um, Lilac, third place. And um, well done for second place. And well done for Mohammed in first place. And well done to everyone else for participating as well. So let's get back to the session and we will be going through dependent and independent probability. <clears throat> so today we'll be looking at what are dependent and independent probabilities, how can we calculate probabilities using tree diagrams, and how to answer exam questions on dependent and independent probabilities. 
So first things first, let's go through how to find probabilities. So probability is about estimating or calculating how likely or probable something is going to happen. So you can think of it like, um, what are the chances that it's going to rain today? Or what are the chances that um, you have chips for dinner or something like that? And um, probability is all about chances. So probabilities can be described using words, decimals, percentages or fractions. So this will link into another session that we did a couple of weeks ago on percentages and fractions and decimals. Um, you can write them as equivalent ones as well. Probabilities can be written in any one of the four um, forms. Now, um, what you do have to remember as well for your exam is that you can represent probabilities on a probability scale. So we'll have a look at probability scale over here. Let me zoom out a little bit. So this is an example of probability scale. So the most important parts to remember are linking the fractions, the decimals and the percentages and also the words um, in terms of their meanings and matching them to where they would lie on a probability scale. So if we look at zero, this is impossible. If you have a probability of zero, this means that it's never going to happen. It's not possible for it to happen. Um, it's kind of like saying if you had a bag um, full of only um, red counters, what's the probability of picking a blue counter? Well, there's no blue counters in the bag, so it's zero. It's impossible to pick a blue counter out of a bag full of red counters. Um, the next one is unlikely. So if it was a quarter or 0 0.25 or 25%, they're all exactly the same value. Um, and we would say this would be an unlikely probability. So it's kind of like um, anything which is possible, but it's not very likely to happen. So like say winning the lottery, that's possible. People do win the lottery, but it's not very likely that you're going to win it. Um, the next one is a half, 0.5, 50%. So let's say flipping a coin, you can either get heads or tails. Um, so that would be an even chance. That's what we call an even chance. Um, three quarters, 0 0.75 and 75%. Um, something that's very likely to happen. So something that has a good possibility that it could happen. Let's say um, the probability that it's going to um, be hot in the summer. It's not definitely going to be hot every single day, but it definitely will be hot on certain days. And then um, the last one is a probability of one. So you could have four over four, one or a hundred percent. So it's definitely going to happen. So something like the chances that it rains during a rainstorm. Well, it's a rainstorm, so it's definitely going to rain. Yeah. So um, you sort of get the gist and the idea of um, a probability scale. A lot of the time in your exams, they do label them with words. So make sure you understand where those words will lie on a probability scale. Perfect. So let's go on to actually finding probability. So we know how to represent it on a scale. Now it's about finding what the value is going to be. So when we're finding probabilities, um, the probability of an event is the number of ways the event can occur over the total number of possible outcomes. So to understand this a little bit better, let's go through an example. So here we have um, a fair, fair six-sided dice. What is the probability of rolling an even number? So first of all, let's think about the um, different numbers that I could get when I roll a dice. How many are there? And then how many even numbers are there? So you can either get one, two, three, four, five or six when you roll a dice because it's a six sided um, dice. Now, the number of um, different ways that we could get an even number would either be two, four or six. Yeah. So let me write um, these down. So an even number. You could get two, four or six. So you've got three different possibilities um, that you could um, roll an even number and then the total number of different um, outcomes that you could get when you roll the dice is you could either get one, two, three, four, five or six. So there are six different possibilities. So the probability 
of rolling an even number would be three different choices for even numbers out of the total six numbers that you could have gotten when you roll the dice. And if we simplify this fraction, so we know that they're both multiples of three, so if I divided the top and the bottom by three, I will get one over two. So my probability is a half. You could also write that as 0 0.5, you could also write that as 50%, or you could say that it's an even chance. That's also okay. But I would say every time they ask you to um, leave your, to give a probability as an answer for an exam, always leave it as either a fraction, a decimal or percentage, and it's okay to leave it as however you've calculated it. There's no particular way of leaving a probability unless they tell you to leave it as a percentage or as a decimal or as a fraction. So it's okay to leave it as a half. And it's also okay to leave it as three over six as well. If they want you to leave it as a half, they will ask you in its simplest form. So remember when we went through fractions, make sure you simplify it. Cool, do we have any um, questions? Cool, perfect, no. So um, let's have a go at this example question then so there are 49 counters in a bag 20 of the counters are red the rest of the counters are blue one of the counters is taken at random find the probability that the counter is blue so 49 counters in a bag if 20 of them are red and the rest of them are blue to work out how many are blue you just need to work out the difference so blue is going to be equal to 49 take away 20 so 49 counters take away 20, you get to 29. Um, and they're saying that one of the counters is taken at random. So find the probability that the counter is blue. So if there's 29 blue counters in the bag, you have a choice of 29 different counters that you could have picked. So that's 29 and then we'll have over and then um, the total number of counters you have in the bag is 49. So you'd be left with 29 over 49. Now, um, there's no number that goes both into 29 and 49. So um, you would leave that as your final answer. So hopefully that um, makes sense to everyone. And we will move on to <coughs> the next part, which is on frequency trees. Now frequency trees, um, a frequency is just the number of times an event occurs. A frequency tree records information about given frequencies and can be used to calculate probabilities. So here we have a frequency tree. Now do not confuse these with probability trees. We will go through probability trees um, soon, but frequency trees in general um, just have the numbers. There are no fractions, there's no decimals or percentages. It's just how many times something occurs or how many people are in a certain event. So if we look at um, the one at the bottom, here we've got 50 people, they're sitting their driving test. Um, so we've got 50 people in total and then they split it between 34 and 16. So here we can tell that 10 or more people, um, that 34 people had 10 or more hours of lessons and 16 people had less than 10 hours of lessons. And then they split it again to tell us how many of those people um, passed their exam and failed their exam. So that's how um, we can calculate frequency trees. <clears throat> we know that these two numbers here, a pass and a fail, would add up to give us this total number here. Same thing with here, four plus 12 gives us 16. Then when we add these two numbers, they will add to give us 50. So they're just branches. So remember when you add up the particular branches which are linked to a certain section of um, the tree, that's why it's called a tree, um, you get to that particular sum. So if we looked at this example question, what is the probability that a person chosen at random failed their test? So first of all, you need to see how many people failed their test in general. Doesn't matter whether they spent 10 or more hours or less than 10 hours, that hasn't been given to us in the question. So how many people in total failed their test? So six people over here failed and 12 people over here failed. So we've got six plus 12, which gives us 18. It's the total number of people who failed their test. And what's the total number of people who took the test? So there's 50. So our final answer will be 18 people 
out of 50. And then you can simplify this if you wanted to. So we know that um, they're both even numbers, so we could have 9 over 25, because we could divide the top and the bottom by 2, we get 9 over 25, and this is the fraction in its simplest form. So that's how you would use a frequency tree to calculate probability. Um, so we've got an example question here on frequency trees, which we'll go through. <clears throat> so here we've got 200 people and they live in a village. Um, 23 people do not have a garden. 10 males do not have a garden. Um, and 95 people are male. So um, uses information to complete the frequency tree. So let's do this part, this, um, part first. So um, we have 200 people in total. Now they've told us that 23 people do not have a garden. So we know that the number 23 should go over here because that's how many people do not have a garden. Now remember, each of the branches um, that are linked to a particular section have to add up to that section. So if 23 people do not have a garden, that means we have to do 23, take away 200 to get to how many people do have a garden. And this would be 177, because that is 200 minus 23. So we've got 177 people do have a garden. Now the next part they told us is that 10 males do not have a garden. So we go to people who do not have a garden, and then we go to males. So we know that this one over here would be 10 because that's 10 males who do not have a garden. Now again, um, we know that each of the branches have to add up to that section. So we do 23 take away 10 to work out how many females do not have a garden. So this would be 13. So we've got 10 plus 13 gives us 23. So that one is correct. Now the last piece of information to help us to um, complete the frequency tree um, is this part here. So 95 people are male. So we know 10 males do not have a garden. So the remaining people who are males will have a garden. So we know that to work out this part um, of our frequency tree, we need to do 95 take away 10, which is just 85. Yep, so hopefully um, you guys have got that particular um, got that particular answer. So that's just 10 plus 85. So then to work out the remaining females and um, the last part of our frequency tree, all we have to do is do 177 minus 85. And I'm going to use a calculator for this part as well. So 177 minus 85 gives us 92. So that's how you would complete a frequency um, tree. I would say sometimes they give you a lot of information. Do it in the way that I have. Start step by step. Start with the first point and work your way down. Um, try not to do everything all at once because um, it can get a bit confusing and you are likely to make silly mistakes. So we've completed our um, frequency tree. So the next question is now asking, um, one of the people who does not have a garden is chosen at random. Write down that the probability um, of this person is female. So first of all, we're not talking about the entire 200 people who were asked in the village. We're only talking about the people who do not have a garden and how many of those people are female. So first of all, how many females do not have a garden? We go to do not have a garden and female, so we know there is a total of 13 females who do not have a garden. And then the people who we are talking about are people who do not have a garden. So that will go on our denominator. And that is 23. 23 people in general do not have a garden. So 13 females out of 23 people who do not have a garden. And there are no um, common factors between 13 and 23. So this would be your final answer. So hopefully that makes um, sense to everyone. I will check the Q&A for a second. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. So um, let's have a go at um, the next section then. So now we're on to dependent and independent probabilities. 
So what is an independent probability? So events are independent events if the occurrence of one event does not affect the probability um, of the other. So with an example, if I um, had a coin and I tossed it twice um, and it lands on heads up on the first toss and it lands um, heads up on the second toss as well, those are independent events. The fact that I tossed it the first time and it landed on heads up, it doesn't have an effect of whether it's going to land heads up or tails on the second time that I throw the dice. So this is what we call independent events. Yeah. Um, hopefully that makes um, sense to you. May, if it doesn't, hopefully it will make sense when I talk about dependent probabilities and events. So let's have a look at um, dependent probabilities. So events are dependent if the occurrence of one event affects the probability of the other. So if we look at this example, so let's say you have a draw and it contains five white socks and four black socks. So a sock is taken and not replaced in the draw. This means that the next time a sock will be picked, one of the socks will be missing. So this will affect the probability. So if you think about it, let's say that you have the draw, you pick one white sock um, out of the nine socks that were in um, the draw. The next time you go to pick, you could pick another white sock, but it's not out of nine anymore because you have one missing. It's out of eight. So it affects the probability. It will be one out of, um, sorry, it will be four out of eight for the next one instead of five out of nine. We're going to go through more about this example. So if it's not making too much sense now, it will do in um, a few minutes when we go through actual examples using numbers. <coughs> So um, when we are talking about dependent and independent probabilities, we mainly talk about probability tree diagrams. <clears throat> so um, with tree diagrams, they look a little bit similar to frequency trees, but please do not get them confused. Probability tree diagrams use either decimals, percentages or fractions. Frequency trees use actual whole value numbers. They don't use prob probabilities. That's the difference. Frequencies are numbers, probability trees are probabilities. So don't get the two confused. So tree diagrams is another way of representing and calculating probabilities. So each branch is labeled at the end with its outcome and the probability is written um, along the side. So if we look at this example below, so if we look at the diagram first, um, it's split it into, if I tossed a coin, um, so we've got our first toss and then we've got our second toss. So the first one, you'll have a 50% chance of getting heads um, or tails. So you've got 50% or 0 0.5 on each branch. And they tell you the first time if I get heads or the um, first time if I get tails. Now, if I toss the coin again, you have different, um, you have the same outcome because it's still 50%. It doesn't affect it. So this one is independent because the probability is exactly the same. So it hasn't been affected, but I could either get a heads and a heads or a heads and a tails or a tails and a heads and a tails and a tails. So that's why we've got two separate branches coming from each of the first outcomes. So if we look at the question, so Ben tosses a coin twice. Um, on the right is a probability tree to represent this. Yeah. So if I wanted to work out what's the probability of getting heads and heads, I would use this branch here and then I'd use this branch here and if I wanted the probability of working out um, the tails um, if I wanted to work out two tails be this one here and this one here and we will go through more um, we will go through actual examples as well but just to understand for those of you who aren't familiar with probability trees so <clears throat> Tree diagrams in a little bit um, more detail as well. To find the probability of one event occurring and another event occurring, we multiply the probabilities together. Now, um, if we wanted to work out the probability of one event occurring or another event occurring, then you add the probabilities together. So when it's and, you multiply. When it's or, you add. So if we look at this example, so this is about um, our socks in the drawer. So the same example I used a few slides ago. 
So here we've got five white socks and four black socks in the drawer. Now I want to pick out two socks. So they split it into first pick and second pick. Now, um, before we actually answer the question, I just like to point out a few things. So remember how I was talking about if you pick out the socks and um, you don't replace them, here you have five out of nine. So you have five white socks out of nine, so you know there's a total of nine socks in the drawer. If you don't replace it, then you're left with eight socks. So the probability changes. This is what we call dependent. It, they depend on each other. So they, they do affect one another. Now, if I pick out one white sock um, from the drawer, that means that there's one white sock missing. So there's not five anymore, there's only four. That's why we've got four out of eight. So we only have eight socks and there's only four of them which are white, but there's still four which are black because we didn't decide to pick black in the first place. But if we did decide to pick black, then we still have five white socks because we didn't take any white, there's still all five white, but there are three black socks left over. So that's how you would complete a tree diagram with dependent probabilities. Always make sure you know how many are left over and how many of which type are left over as well. So going back to the question, um, what is the probability of picking two black socks? So this would be an and probability because you're picking one black sock and another black sock. So we go to the first black sock, which would be over here. So that's four over nine. That's a probability of picking it first of all. And the second, um, if I wanted to pick it in my second pick, then that would be three over eight. Now, as I said before, this is an and probability. It's one black sock and another one. So we're going to multiply the two together. So we've got four over nine multiplied by three over eight. So it'd be four times three, which is 12, over seven times eight, which is 72. And then you can simplify it after this as well. So um, if you wanted to simplify it into its simplest um, form, you know that they're both multiples, um, <clears throat> they're both multiples of two, so you could half it, so you've got six over 36. And then you can see that these two, six and 36, are also both multiples of six so you can leave it as one over six because six divided by six is one 36 divided by six is six so um this would be the answer in its simplest form one over six so hopefully that um, makes a little bit of sense and if we look at um the second question what is the probability of picking either two white socks or two black socks you can see that this is an or question so at some point we're gonna to have to add probabilities, but let's try and make sense of the question first. So what's the probability of picking either two white socks or two black socks? Now, if I pick two white socks, that means my first pick is white and my second pick is white as well. So that's what we're gonna to have to consider first. So the probability of, um, I'll just put two uh, white socks. So this, so if I pick the white socks as my first pick, I'll have five over nine. And I want the second one as well. So I'm gonna multiply this with four over eight. So five over nine multiplied by four over eight. So five times four is 20 over um, nine times eight, which is 72. You can simplify it if you want to. I would say simplify at the end. Um, when you've gotten your final answer because it will make calculations a little bit easier and quicker. So that's the first one and the second one was two black socks. So now that's the next one that we have to consider. So um, my first pick would be black socks and black socks again. Now we've already calculated this probability, we calculated this first of all. Now we got the answer as a six, as um, simplified. I'm going to take 12 over 72. Now the reason why I said don't simplify your answers and um, when you're doing multiple step questions like this because we're going to have to add the fractions now because it said what is the probability of two white socks or two black socks. So we've worked out the first probability and we've worked out the second one. So the last thing to do is to add them together because it says or. 
And remember, when you add fractions, you have to have a common denominator. That's why I said don't simplify it. So now it's very, um, it's very easy to calculate this one. So 20 plus 12 is 32 over 72, and then you can simplify it afterwards. So you can half both of them. They both go into um, two. So the top one will be 16 and the bottom one will be 36. And then you can simplify it even further. They're both multiples um, of four. So you can divide the top one by four to get to four and the bottom one by four to get to nine. So four ninths would be um, the simplest fraction. <clears throat> so that would be um, your answer in its simplest form. So let me zoom out so you can see the entire question. Um, so hopefully um, that makes a little bit of sense for you to work out how to work out, um, how to calculate probabilities. And does anyone have, oops, does anyone have any questions? Okay, um, some people are a little bit confused, so I'll just quickly explain how um, I did that one because we have a little bit of time. So um, when you want to work out the probability of the first event happening and a second event happening, you multiply them, just like what I did with the sock. So I wanted two black socks, so I wanted one black sock and another black sock, so I multiplied them together. Now the second one was asking me for two white socks or two black socks. So I need to work out the probability for each first, the probability of two white socks, and then the probability of two black socks. And because it says or, I need to add them, because that's what we do with probabilities when it says or. So once I've worked them out, which I did, I got 20 over 72 and 12 over 72, you add them together and you get 32 over 72. And when you simplify it, it simplifies to four over nine. So hopefully that um, explains it. Remember, if you are a little bit confused or you do want to go over it again, it will be on the My Tutor YouTube channel as well. <clears throat> so just quickly explaining um, independent probabilities with tree diagrams. So here, um, if two events are independent, um, that means the first event doesn't have an impact on the second one. So like what I was explaining before, you still have a 50% chance, whether it's your first toss or your second toss, it doesn't matter. You tossing the heads or a tails on your first toss when you flip a coin doesn't affect whether you get heads or a tails when you flip it again. And it still won't affect it, even if you do it a hundred times, it's not gonna affect it. Yeah, so that's what we call an independent probability. Um, so we will go through this question. And then we'll go through dependent probabilities and then um, I'll answer any questions which people are still having. Let me zoom out a little bit more. Okay, so Hannah is going to play one game of chess and one game of backgammon. The probability she will win the game of chess is 0 0.6 and the probability that she will win the game of backgammon is 0 0.7. <clears throat> So um, let's fill out the probability tree diagram. So the first one is chess. They've told us this over here. So what is the probability that Hannah wins chess? Now they've told us that it's 0 0.6. So 0 0.6 will go over here. Now you can either win or lose a game. With chess, you cannot draw and you can win or lose. So if she wins with a probability of 0 0.6, we know probabilities add up to one. So the probability that she does not win is 0 0.4. Yeah, now um, with backgammon, um, that's the next section that we need to work out as well. So what's the probability that Hannah wins backgammon? They've told us that it's 0 0.7. Now, the fact that she wins chess or loses chess does not have an effect on whether she wins backgammon or she loses backgammon. So it doesn't matter whether she wins or loses chess. So this probability is still going to be exactly the same. So this is an independent um, probability. It's an independent event. Chess doesn't affect backgammon and backgammon doesn't affect chess. So this is why you still have exactly the same probabilities here. And if I was to work out the probability that she doesn't win, it would be 0 0.3. 
because we know probabilities have to add up to one. So that's how we would complete the tree diagram. Now the next question is asking us to work out the probability that Hannah will win both games. So that means she has to win chess, so we use this line over here, that means she also has to win backgammon. Now this one is an and, she has to win chess and she has to win backgammon because she has to win both games. So we do 0 0.6 multiplied by 0 0.7 and this will give us 0 0.42. So this would be our answer and it's enough to just leave it as a decimal. Remember, probability can be left as a decimal, a fraction or a percentage. So that is independent probabilities when they don't affect each other. Now, dependent probabilities is when <coughs> is when they do affect each other. So just like the um, the socks in the drawer. So whether I pick out a white or a black sock, it will affect the probability of the second one occurring. So that's why you have different probabilities um, as you go along. So remember, at the beginning you had nine, oops, at the beginning you had nine socks in the drawer, but then it goes down to eight because you're not replacing the sock. And um, so you're only left with eight socks left in the drawer. Now, if you pick um, the white one first, that means again, you have one less white sock in the drawer. So you're left with four. Same thing goes with the black one. If you pick the black one first, that means you're left with one less black sock, so you're left with three. So the probabilities change as you go along depending on, um, depending on your first pick. Yep, so this is what we call dependent probability because they literally depend on each other. Now, um, a little hint is usually dependent probabilities, they either tell you that it's dependent or a little hint is that they say without replacement. So if you take something, if you take, like, say, a counter out of a bag or um, you're playing bingo and you take the ball out of the, um, the case, then um, if you don't replace it, then you're left with one less item in the bag or in the drawer or whatever. So if it says without replacement, it's a dependent probability because you'll have one less after every pick. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Um, does anyone have any questions? Because we are at um, quarter two. So if you do have any questions um, which you'd still like me to go through and ask, uh, an answer, sorry, um, please do put them in the Q&A and I will try to answer them. Um, if not, we will move on to doing um, the final Kahoot for the end of the session. And this will be based on um, independent and dependent probabilities and a little bit about probability scales as well. So if you do have any questions, make sure you put it, make sure you put it in the Q&A and I will try to answer um, all of them. Cool, I don't think there's any, any new questions, perfect. So um, let's go to the final Kahoot then. Um, so here is the, hopefully everyone can see it. Here's the new pin for the new game. Um, I like everyone to at least try and participate. If you can't log in, still participate at home. Um, and depending on how much time we have left, we might go through another um, exam example. But if you do have any questions um, which you still want me to answer, even during the Kahoot, Put it in the Q&A and I will answer it before we end the session. <laughs> I'm liking some of these names, guys. <laughs> cool, so I'll wait a little bit longer so everyone can participate or at least um, try to. If I do start it before you have logged in, the pin will be at the bottom. Um, so you can still join in if you haven't managed to join in before I start the game. So I'll wait a little bit longer. Okay. Right, 
so I am going to start it. <clears throat> so if you do want to join in, like halfway through or after I've started it, the pin is at the bottom. So first question, where on the probability scale would the event of winning the lottery be? Would it be at A, B, C or D? Perfect, it would be a B. So if I um, get it up quickly, remember winning the lottery is not very likely that you will win the lottery. It's quite unlikely, but it's still possible. So since it's possible, it's not gonna be A, because A is zero. <clears throat> it's not gonna be C, because C is between half and one, which means likely. D is certain, it's not certain you're gonna win the probability, otherwise everyone would be rich. So it's B, it's unlikely, it's between zero and a half. That's where um your that's where it would lie on the probability scale. So well done for everyone who got that question correct. So next question: You flip a fair coin twice. What is the probability of getting tails both times? So is it a half? Is it a quarter? Is it an eighth? Is it one? So think about it, is it an and or is it an or question? <clears throat> you flip a fair coin and you get tails both times. How would you calculate that? So perfect, it is a quarter, it's not a half. The reason why is because if you flip a coin once, it's 50% chance, if you flip it again, it's still a 50% chance, but remember, you want both tails. So if we were to draw the tree diagram, it would be a half multiplied by another half because you get tails and another tails. So it's a half times a half, which is a quarter. So well done for everyone. <clears throat> you got that one correct. So next question. So 120 people were asked whether they can drive or not. How many females can drive? So have a look at the frequency tree. <laughs> how would I calculate how many females can drive? So what would I need to do? Okay, it is 32 and I will show you why. <clears throat> so here we've got two things missing. We've got females missing and then we've got females who can drive which are also missing. So if I did 120 minus 72, I get 48 females. But that doesn't tell me how many females can drive. So I would still need to do 48 minus 16 to get to 32 which is um, which would tell me how many females can drive. So remember to read the whole question, guys. So well done for anyone who did get um, that question right. Perfect. So frequency trees are the same as probability trees. Is that true or is that false? Are frequency trees the same as probability trees? Perfect, it is false. They are not the same. Frequency trees use numbers, probability trees use probabilities. So either decimals, fractions or percentages. So well done um, for everyone who did get that question right. So next one, um, what is the probability that someone chosen at random can drive? So we're back here with this same frequency tree, but we've got them filled in. How do we work out the probability that someone chosen at random can drive. How do we do that?
well done everyone it is nine so for anyone who didn't get it if i um, zoom in and show you we've got um so we wanted to work out how many people can drive so we look at how many people can drive we've got 22 sorry 28 who are males and 32 who are females we add them together to work out the total number of people who can drive you get 60 and then you do that out of the total number of people who are asked so it'd be 60 out of 120 which is a half so well done to everyone who got that question right perfect so the next one i roll a fair six-sided dice what is the probability of rolling a multiple of three So this was near to the beginning of the um, of the session where I was telling you how to work out probabilities similar to what we did earlier when we were rolling even numbers. So think of it like that. Perfect. It is one over three. So um, different multiples of three that you could get when you roll a dice could either be three. Three is a multiple of three or you could get six. Six is also a multiple of three. So there's two different um, numbers that you could get out of a total six that you could get. So it's two out of six, which simplifies to a third. So well done for everyone who got that one right. So true or false, Andy throws a fair six-sided dice. Is the following statement correct? So he says the probability of getting a six on both rows is two out of six. Is that right? It's after he throws the dice twice. Perfect. Well done, everyone. He is false. It is incorrect. So the probability of getting a six on both rows will not be two out of six. It will be one over six multiplied by one over six, which is one over 36. So well done for everyone because you all got that right. So an independent probability is when one event affects the probability of the other. Is this true or is this false? Read the question carefully. So what is the definition of an independent probability? You're right, it is false. Remember, independent is when they don't affect one another. Dependent is when they do affect one another. So this definition would be for a dependent probability, not an independent probability. So well done to everyone who got that one right. Next question, worth double the points. What is the probability that the student fails both the final exam and the retake? So we've got a tree diagram. You've got a minute to answer this question. So don't rush it. You have got enough time. There are parts to this missing. So you'd have to fill them in first and then work out the probability that the student fails both their final exam and the retake. So you still have 30 seconds left. So you have enough time to calculate it and check your answer. well done everyone so it is 0 0.12 so for those of you who didn't get it let me explain it quickly so um you have your final exam and your retake now um remember if you pass an exam you don't have to take a retake so that's why we only have branches on the fail part of an exam now probabilities have to add up to one so the probability of failing your final exam is 0 0.2 so that's what we would fill in um in the first missing part the second missing part we would fill in as 0 0.6. Now, if we wanted the probability of failing the, both the exam and the retake, we want the probability of failing the final exam and failing the retake. So you do 0 0.2 multiplied by 0 0.6. And when you multiply them, you get 0 0.12. Perfect. So well done um, for everyone who did get that um, that question so the leaderboard is changing quite a lot so this is the final question is the following an independent probability or a dependent probability so there are two lemons and one lime in a bag 
what is the probability of picking two lemons from the bag? Would this be an independent probability or a dependent probability? Well done, it is dependent. So if I get up the um, question again, so you have two lemons and one lime. So remember, if I pick, so I want to pick out two lemons. If I pick one lemon, it will be two out of three because there's two lemons out of three different um, types of fruit in the bag. So that's the first pick. Now I've already picked out a lemon, so I'm left with not only two pieces of fruit, but only one lemon left in the bag. So that would be a half, one out of two. So the probability changes. So the probability of me picking it out a second time is affected with whether I pick it out the first time or not as well. So this would be a dependent probability. So well done to everyone participating. Let's look at the leaderboard. So Blackheart came third place, well done. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that, but you came second place, well done. And first place, I'm gonna say Seji, um, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, but well done for coming first place. So well done everyone for participating. Um, and hopefully you all um, understand independent and dependent probabilities a little bit um, better. So does anyone have any questions before we finish? If you do, quickly put them in the um, Q&A. It doesn't seem like anyone does. So um, well done to everyone participating today. I hope you really enjoyed it. Remember, if you do um, want to, if you do want to put, if you do want to watch it back, sorry, it will be posted on YouTube. I'm not exactly too sure when it will be um, posted on YouTube, but give it a couple of days and you should see it pop up um, soon. Um, remember, if you do feel like you need private tuition as well, you need a little bit more one-to-one -one on certain, um, you need a little bit more one-to-one -one on certain um, topics in math or any other topic as well, um, you can go onto my tutor and look for um, a tutor to help you. There are loads of tutors who are amazing at what they do that can help you. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you guys next week. So for now, um, have a good week, everyone. Bye.